Welcome to our live webinar titled, Nutrition and Bone Marrow Failure Disease. Thank you for joining us. My name is Catrell Harris, and I'm the manager of learning events for the Aplastic Anemia MDS International Foundation, and I will be moderating the presentation today. As we get started, I would like to acknowledge Alexion Pharmaceuticals, Amgen, and the Celgene Corporation for providing educational grants to help support this and other webinar education programs. I would also like to share with you some additional educational opportunities you might be interested in. This year, the Aplastic Anemia MDS International Foundation is hosting several regional conferences on living with aplastic anemia, MDS, or PNH. These free regional conferences will occur around the country and are designed to make information on bone marrow failure diseases more accessible to patients and families. We have already had four successful conferences in Phoenix, Houston, Cleveland, and San Francisco. Registration for the remaining conferences is now open. Boston, which is September the 7th, and Tampa, which is November the 9th. Please visit our website, www.aamds.org, for more information on the conferences and all of our learning events. Today's webinar will be archived on our online learning center within 7 to 10 business days. You will be notified when it is live and ready for viewing. Immediately following the presentation, there will be a question and answer session. Please feel free to submit questions at any time during the presentation by using the text chat window on the lower right-hand side of your screens. To submit a question or comment, type your question in the small text box just below the, the text chat window. When you have finished typing your question, hit enter. We will do our best to get to all questions. When asking questions, I ask ask that you do two things to help us manage incoming questions. First, submit your entire question all at the same time. Do not submit it in pieces or send additional information. We receive many questions and will not be able to piece your question together for multiple submissions. Provide the minimum amount of personal information you feel is necessary to respond to your question. Lengthy questions can be difficult to understand and also to respond to. You will not be able to communicate with others during the session via the chat window, we will be the only one who can see the question being asked. If you would like to connect with others, there's an online support form called Marrow Forms, available at www.marrowforms.org that you can access via our website. We also have a peer support network, which is a national network of volunteers, including patients, caregivers, and family members, willing to listen and offer support. Immediately following this webinar, a post-event survey will pop up on your screens. Please take a few minutes to complete this brief survey. This will help us to improve our future webinars and make sure we are meeting your needs. As a reminder, you can submit your questions on the right-hand side of your screens at any time. Today's presenter is Ms. Jennifer Wolfshaw. Ms. Wolfshaw was born in Metairie, Louisiana, but claims Texas as her home. She's a proud graduate of Texas A&M University and relocated to Dallas to complete an internship and secondary degree from the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. She has spent the past seven years practicing dietetics at Children's Medical Center Dallas University Hospital and also Simmons Cancer Center, where she most recently worked with malignant and non-malignant hematologic diseases. She is credentialed as a certified specialist in oncology and a member of the Oncology Dietetic Practice Group for the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. Mrs. Wolfshaw and her husband have recently relocated, and, but she has kept busy with private nutrition consultations and speaking engagements. Welcome, Ms. Wolfshaw. Thank you so much, Cottrell, and thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, today we're going to talk about nutrition and bone marrow failure, and as you know, this is a very broad topic, and I'm going to do my best to um, cater this talk to each person individually, so please um, feel free to jot down your questions, and I'll do my best to get to them at the end of this um, so we can really make sure to tailor this, this talk to you specifically. Today, our main objectives are we're going to discuss how to optimize blood production and maintain health. We're going to identify the building blocks of a healthy diet, discuss nutrition, specifically when patients are going through treatment, supplements, and also go over some reliable resources. Now, 
I know that every time I go to a restaurant, either I feel like this or someone I'm dining with feels like this. We just don't know what to get off the menu. I feel like everything is going to be bad for me. Either something's going to cause cancer, something's going to clog my arteries. Where do where do we begin? What do we order? What do we do? What do we even eat? Well, fortunately, the American Institute for Cancer Research has put forth a set of guidelines to really help us navigate all of the ever-changing nutrition information out there. And this information I love because it not only talks about preventing cancer, but it also talks it also applies to preventing heart disease, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, and also just promoting a healthy diet in particular. Um, the first recommendation, which we're going to talk in much detail later on, is to be as lean as possible without becoming underweight. And in this day and age, we're always looking for the magic bullet. What is the superfood that I need to eat? Well, we really need to not go for the superfood before we go to looking at our own weight and looking at um, in the mirror. So the very first thing, the most important thing, is to be as lean as possible without being underweight. And to help us do that, being physically active for at least 30 minutes each day will help with this. And in reality, if you want to try to lose weight, um, the recommendation is 60 to 90 minutes most days of the week. Of course, you want to make sure to get clearance from your physician before starting any kind of a new activity plan. Avoiding sugary drinks and limiting the consumption of energy-dense foods can help with this. I talk to my patients oftentimes about the difference between energy-dense foods and nutrient-dense foods, and it's important to pick nutrient-dense foods. And a good example of this is um, at Starbucks, you can look in that delicious pastry case and you'll see a slice of banana bread. Well, banana bread can contain close to 500 calories, but a banana near the cash register can contain about 80 to 100 calories per banana. So really, you're going to get you're going to maximize your nutrition if you go with the actual banana instead of the processed banana bread for far less calories. So it's always important to try to pick the nutrient-dense foods. Eating more of a variety of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and legumes can also be helpful with this. We're going to talk about this in much more detail. Limiting the consumption of red meat and avoiding processed meat. In actuality, red meat um, has gotten a bad rap. And really, the recommendation is just to limit this to less than 18 ounces in the course of a week. So that's a, still a pretty generous amount of red meat if you think about a portion being the size of the palm of your hand. Um, you can still have red meat in moderation. I would choose a lean cut, preferably baked, broiled, or grilled at a lower temperature instead of the charring, the charring meats on, on the barbecue. But really, meat... Red meat still has its place, but processed meats, really, we can all do much, much less of that in our diet. If something looks like it could be hanging on at the grocery store on, in the deli counter for just months and months, then that's probably not something that we need to be putting in our, to our body. When man processes foods, we um, tend to add a lot of unnecessary fat, salt, sugar, um, all different types of um, chemicals that can be harmful and cancer-causing agents or just cause a lot of other um, diseases. If consumed at all, please limit alcohol to two drinks for men and one drink for a day for women. And this is, uh, the recommendation really is if you do not drink alcohol, don't start drinking alcohol to protect your heart or anything like that. But really, um, if you are, already drinking alcohol, then to limit that and to make sure that you're pay attention to the serving size for alcohol. Six ounces or five, five to six ounces is uh, considered a serving of a glass of wine for reference. Limiting the consumption of salty foods and processed foods, again, uh, don't use supplements to protect against cancer. We're going to discuss this in a lot of detail later on and really just focusing on adding whole foods and non-processed foods into our diet. 
I'm in the school of thought that thinks that we can add good foods into our diet, so hopefully it will naturally displace some of the processed or um, some of the other junk that we typically eat in our diet. And always remember, don't use tobacco in any form. Now, maintaining a healthy weight. Um, one of the best measures of a healthy weight is waist circumference. And the reason for this is because the fat that's deposited around the waist, around the belly button area, is crucial that we um, really limit that. That fat surrounds um, vital organs such as the liver, the pancreas, and when extra fat is um, deposited in that area, it can really mess up the metabolism of our um, the metabolism of our food, and it can cause something called metabolic syndrome, which is basically the perfect storm of um, a disruption. A dis um, disruption in your hormones that can lead to diabetes, chronic kidney disease, cancer, inflammation, heart disease, all of these things. So really that's why it's very important to watch that waist circumference. For men, we want to keep your weight less than 40 inches and women less than 35 inches. One really great way to do this um, to maintain a healthy weight in general is to think about having smaller, more frequent meals and snacks into the diet um, and make sure you pay attention to the fact that these are smaller portions. We're not talking about having five meals a day, but smaller, smaller portions of meals. Um, focusing on fiber and protein is a great way to not only be mindful of the foods that you're eating, but really make you feel full. They're going to, these two um, components, fiber and protein are going to increase satiety and make us feel more full longer. They also do an excellent job of stabilizing the blood sugar. So if you focus on eating a good source of fiber and protein for each small meal and snack, we're gonna level out our blood sugar and minimize those spikes. I have patients a lot of times that will tell me that they you know, don't even feel hungry till about three o'clock in the afternoon and then they're just ravenous and they get home from work and eat everything in sight and I say, you know, extreme hunger, extreme hunger equals extreme eating, and we really want to avoid that. There's actually been some research that talks about when our blood sugar rises very quickly after we eat a very large meal, the amount of insulin that our bodies are making can actually um, be one of the, it could possibly be one of the things that um, can cause cancer. So we want to really keep level blood sugars and avoid those very large spikes in the blood sugar when a lot of insulin is going to need to be made and released to bring that back down to normal. So a good goal is to aim for 25 to 30 grams of fiber per day, which is quite a bit. And so just start paying attention to some of those food labels and trying to increase the fiber in the diet. Now, a great way to do this is to focus on eating those nutrient-dense foods first. So these are minimally processed plant-based foods. And look at the recommendation. It's 8 to 10 servings of fruits and vegetables every day. And I know um, people look at this and say, there's no way I can get that into my diet. But really, if you start focusing on adding foods into the diet, it's really going to start displacing some of the other foods that we're eating. And these are the foods that we need to be filling up on, that we need to be focusing on. These are the green leafy vegetables. These are also known as the cruciferous vegetables. So Brussels sprouts, broccoli, um, cauliflower, kind of this more stinky vegetables. They're also the kale, the char, the mustard, collard greens. Um, these are all excellent. The dark colored berries, the blueberries, the blackberries, um, as, as, acai berries, these are all great choices. The darker the color, the better. Um, they're going to have more antioxidants in them. Making your grains whole. So when you're grocery shopping, looking for the label to say 100% whole wheat or whole grain, these foods are going to have less processed ingredients in them, and it's going to preserve some of the fiber. So um, looking to expand your grains, so thinking about trying barley or um, rye, quinoa, there's so many different types of grains on the market now, um, beans and legumes, 
They're an excellent source of iron, protein, fiber, and folate. Hummus is also a great snack if you can think about it in terms of adding avocado or lima beans or edamame. This can really up the nutritional value of your snack and really make you feel more full. Um, healthy fats are also great to incorporate into the diet. Nuts, seeds, avocados, olives, olive oil, flax seed, fish. Um, these are um, these foods, when we really focus on them, this, this is going to make it easier to get to that 8 to 10 servings of fruits and vegetables each day. Um, Calcium-rich foods are um, also very important. Uh, Greek yogurt is something that's been gaining a lot of popularity because it has double the protein. And most people can tolerate uh, yogurt instead of if you, if you find yourself sensitive to lactose, a lot of people can tolerate yogurt instead of drinking a glass of milk, so that may be an option for you. There's also some really great dairy-free products out there right now. Almond milk actually has double the amount of calcium than cow's milk does. So, you know, t taking a look at the grocery store and trying different foods if one food might not agree with you. And then, of course, those lean proteins. Now, we're going to shift gears and talk about nutrition specifically for treatment. And now, this is when uh, nutrition, this is a window in time where everything that we just talked about, we're going to kind of use a different approach and we're really going to tailor our nutrition plan to the specific treatment plan to maximize your treatment plan's effectiveness um, that your doctor has designed specifically for you. So this is where it's important not to just go on the internet and Google and find a a blanket approach to, you know, what do I do to fight cancer, but really looking at your treatment plan and um, designing a plan just for you with, to, that's supported with your nutrition. Now, specifically for nutri nutrients for the bone and the bone marrow, protein is essential. Protein is the, makes up the building blocks of red and white blood cells. This helps maintain strength, rebuild tissue, it's the key nutrient for maintaining immune function. So that is why it's essential that we focus on protein. Vitamins and minerals that are important include iron, vitamin C, B vitamins. These all help make blood cells. Antioxidants help to maintain the integrity of cells. And calcium and vitamin D for bone health. Adequate calories help provide energy for all bodily functions, keeps the body from breaking down protein. We really want to preserve our own stores. We want to preserve that lean muscle mass. And when the body is stressed, we have increased calorie needs. Um, I tell people that we don't want to lose weight because, unfortunately, we can't pick where the weight comes from. And often the first thing to go is our lean muscle mass. So, we really want to preserve lean muscle mass through treatment. Adequate fluid is required for blood volume and also electrolyte balance. What can and can't nutrition do through treatment? Proper, nu treatment, proper nutrition helps to maintain, uh, helps the body to maintain healthy cells and support repair, to maintain a sense of well-being, when you're, when you're well-nourished, you just feel better, typically, and you have more energy. That's why this is very important. Since the building blocks of red and white blood cells are protein, those red and white blood cells help carry, the red blood cells help carry oxygen throughout our body, which is going to increase our energy level. So um, we really want to make sure that we're getting enough protein and proper nutrition that way. It's going to help reduce the risk of other illnesses help to maximize the impact of treatment. I know at our cancer center, um, patients were not able to receive treatment if they had lost a specific amount of weight. So really, again, that weight maintenance is essential. Poor nutrition does not cause bone marrow failure. It can reduce the quality of life and functional status. It can increase the risk for other illness. It can reduce our body's natural defenses and limit the body's ability to repair itself. So again, I'm harping on this, but maintaining weight. Um, weight loss can increase fatigue, and this is a little bit repetitive, but adequate nutrition, we just have to have it to rebuild and maintain those blood cells, have great immune function, 
preserve that lean muscle mass, optimize energy, and ensure adequate hydration. Now, one of the main side effects to a lot of different types of medicine and treatment that I hear is that just I have no appetite and my appetite is just shot. So one of the best things to do is just thinking um, of eating six to eight very small meals a day instead of three large meals. This is helpful if you pull out a salad plate from your cabinet and tr focus on eating your meal off a, a salad plate, a very small portion. I know a lot of caregivers often will get offended if they prepared this wonderful meal and they sat it down and it was huge and delicious steak meal and then the patient just was overwhelmed and didn't want anything to do with it. So really just trying to focus on having something small and eating when you feel the hungriest, again, using the smaller plate, keeping your favorite foods in the home. This will make it a little bit easier for you to find something that you want to snack on. And setting a timer to go off every hour to every hour and a half throughout the daytime will be helpful. So, you know, every time the timer goes off, get a handful of trail mix or have some um, dried fruit, something like that every hour and a half, um, just something small to keep you going throughout the day. An eating routine can be very helpful. Oftentimes, I hear that the the biggest appetite is first thing in the morning. So if you could start each day um, focusing on a, a great breakfast, then that will get you going. And, and you, throughout the day, you can snack. Um, eating that protein first can be helpful. As you know, when we eat bread products or if we eat carbohydrates, they tend to expand in our stomach. So it, it kind of just shuts off our appetite from everything else. But if you focus on eating the protein first, so either the lean meat or a couple scoops of peanut butter or almond butter um, or having a Greek yogurt, that is going to help you um, actually be able to eat more than if you ate the starch or the carbohydrate portion of your meal first. Another helpful thing is if you separate eating and drinking, liquids also make you feel more full. So keeping um, beverages and your, your meal within 30 minutes 30 minutes of each other should help. Keeping mealtimes relaxing, we want to minimize stress. I know um, it's oftentimes difficult with caregivers wanting to, um, you know, saying you have to eat that, finish eating, finish eating your meal, but really just trying to keep it a very peaceful, low-stress environment. We want to create a good experience when we do have an appetite or we're trying to sit down and have a meal or snack. Carrying snacks with you, um, this these can be prepared in bulk when you're feeling great. You know, you can go to the store and fill up some Ziploc bags with some great high-calorie snack options. Um, some, let's see, there's, um, you can do trail mix. You could do granola, um, some small peanut butter cookies, eggs, anything like that, or even preparing a large um, pimento cheese spread or egg salad, tuna salad, things like that that you can just pull out and eat um, a small amount of when you're feeling better. Um, I even just made these energy these energy cookies the other day for patients that just since I threw in um, my food processor some dates, some cocoa, walnuts, and some flaxseed and just mixed it all up with some salt, and they were delicious. It tasted just like a chocolate truffle. And, you know, that's going to be, that's going to give you some energy with the dates and the walnuts for sure. Uh, nutrition supplements also have their place. Sometimes it is easier to drink your calories rather than um, eating them. So, you know, of course, we've all heard of Insure or Boost, but I do like to put this slide up here to introduce some other products that are available that, you may not have heard of before. Um, Insure Clear is something that um, is just like Insure, but it is more, it's similar to juice. So if you're if you're tired of the milky, kind of the boost taste, then you might want to try something that's more like juice. It still has the added protein in it. It doesn't have very many calories in it, though. So if you're really looking for calories, that might not be the best choice. But Boost Very High Calorie is a great one that um, I have some patients that add this to um, pancake mix or they add it to their cereal or oatmeal in the morning um, or they just drink it straight. 
But this is a great product. It actually has 530 calories for 8 ounces. So this is, you get a lot of bang for your buck with the Boost Very High Calories. Candy Shakes are another excellent product. They make a delicious milkshake. When you mix a packet with um, 8 ounces of whole milk alone, you can have a whopping 600 calories. And then throw in a couple scoops of ice cream, and you know, quickly you can be up at over 1,000 calories per per shake. So that's a great option. Carnation Instant Breakfast is a great product if you are not – if um, a lot of people tell me this one tastes the most normal. It tastes just like chocolate milk. So, again, you can um, experiment with that. Orgain is a great um, new product. This was actually developed by a physician that is a lung cancer survivor, and it has 10 – servings of fruits and vegetables in the organ. And um, what it is, it's, a, it's an all-natural, all-organic product, and it has less sugar than the insurance boost. So if you're conscientious, conscientious about your sugar intake, organ might be a great product for you. Mix One is another one. This one is more of a smoothie. So it has a lot of different fruits, um, fruits uh, in it, and it doesn't taste milky at all. Then a calorie are just tubs um, of a, of a tasteless liquid, and basically you can just dump the tub into anything. I say use it like you use butter, and it adds 300 calories to whatever you're eating. You can't taste it. You can't even detect that it's there. Andrew is just a, a, a protein powder that tastes pretty good. They even make a chicken soup, and it tastes just like chicken noodle soup, but it's a protein supplement. Coast changes are something that a lot of people struggle with. Um, one of the best, best, best things to do for this is um, what we call the salt and soda swish and spit. It's just baking soda, salt, and water. And what you can do is make up a water bottle of this, keep it by the sink, and every time you pass by the sink, just rinse your mouth. And you cannot do this enough times in the day. Not only does it take out bad taste, keep your mouth feeling fresh, some people say it helps to enhance taste, but also if you have any kind of mouth sore or ulcer, this is the best way to help heal that. So um, a lot of patients get the numbing cream from the doctors and they just hate it because it doesn't last very long or it doesn't work, but this, um, the salt and soda, if you do it at least, I'm telling you, five times a day, it really does help. Um, Biotene is another great over-the-counter product. It, they make a toothpaste and a mouthwash that kind of adds saliva to the mouth, and it does help keep your mouth feeling fresh. It's a good taste change agent, something to help with the taste change. Cold and moist um, may be best if you're experiencing this. Um, this is when smoothies really come into play. You can do a lot with smoothies. You can make them very fruity, but if you're sensitive or you're having a very sensitive mouth, you can use cooling fruits like banana or kiwi or even honeydew melons to make a, a more cooling smoothie if the, if the acid and some of the other fruits are aggravating. Um, cold things, um, again, like chicken salad, tuna salad, deviled eggs, um, egg salad, anything where you can add mayonnaise in it and it just kind of goes down a little bit easier can be helpful. Um, any kind of ice cream or yogurt, these are all going to be your friend with this. Liquids, gravies, marinades, sauces, condiments. Um, this is important to experiment with all of these foods, trying to add them, making your foods as moist, especially your proteins, as moist as possible. Um, I have patients that will take all the condiments out of their refrigerator and do a taste test and see if they prefer ketchup or mustard or mayonnaise and just kind of incorporate it on everything. I had one patient that just would put ketchup on everything, and that's how she was able to eat her food. Um, and I know that this changes oftentimes, so sometimes you may feel like one thing tastes good and it'll be completely different the next day, but just having patience with yourself trying it and then trying a food again if it's been quite some time or you know if it's been longer than two weeks since you tried it initially that your taste may have changed again the citrus versus the cooling fruits like we discussed uh, zinc lozenges now there's been some research saying that or supporting that taste change may be related to a zinc deficiency so um, you know zinc lozenges are just over the counter next to the cough drops 
and why it, it wouldn't hurt. You could always try this. They have a lot of tropical flavors, and it would just keep, if nothing else, keep a good taste in your mouth and keep your mouth nice and moist. Um, gum and mints are also very helpful. Plasticware instead of silverware, if things are tasting metallic-y, just get that plastic out of there. Also, baking in um, glass pans instead of aluminum pans can also be helpful with that. And having caregivers prepare food in a completely separate room if you're very sensitive to smells is often helpful. Um, and always remembering, if you can think about food as adding fat, adding something salty, sour, or sweet, that can help with taste change. So either adding butter, adding salt, adding a good sweet and sour kind of marinade for your meat. So these can all help with the taste changes. And also, you know, thinking of using a straw can help also, if, especially if you're having a, trying to drink a smoothie or get down a supplement. Um, the straw b bypasses those front taste buds, so it can be easier to, to get your nutrients in that way. Okay, now nausea and vomiting. Now, simple carbohydrates are, we start digesting them first thing in the mouth. So right when we put them in our mouth, they're already starting to break down. That's why when people are having a lot of vomiting, it's good to stick with the carbs because at least you're going to get some calories, some nutrition, um, because we start absorbing them so quickly. They're so easily easy to break down. So the simple carbohydrates, so the, the white bread, the white rice, the pasta, the things that we usually tell you not to eat, these are going to be your friend when you're having a lot of nausea or vomiting. Pretzels, think, um, pretzels or crackers are also great. Um, because they have the salt, if you're having a lot of vomiting, it's necessary to replenish those electrolytes. Um, or even sometimes people like the cooked sushi. They think that the rice and it's just a little roll and they can just pop it in their mouth and that's okay. Now, some people, they think that carbohydrates just make them totally nauseous. So if that doesn't work for you, trying something with substance, trying something with protein. I love eggs. Often eggs are a really great one because, um, you know, they're very bland. Most people can tolerate them, especially for breakfast. They're a complete protein. You're going to get all your essential amino acids, which, again, are the building blocks for protein. Um, they're easy to tolerate. You can add them into anything. You can add them to casserole, pasta. You can make a breakfast wrap, an omelet. Um, you can make a, you know, a breakfast casserole would be great, and then you have it in the fridge, and you can cut off a, a, a piece of it whenever you're feeling up to it. Um, Hard-boiled eggs, deviled eggs, again, just various ways to prepare eggs. Ginger can also help soothe an upset stomach. Um, anything with at least one gram of real ginger in it can be helpful. So ginger ale, ginger tea, ginger candies, chews, gum. There's now a product called Reed's Nausea Relief, and I know it's available at the Whole Foods store. Um, you could probably find it on Amazon also, but it contains 10 grams of ginger. It's in a little four-ounce container, a little drink, and a lot of my patients just love it because it doesn't taste like ginger. So if that ginger taste is not appealing to you and you think that's going to make you even more nauseated, then um, looking for something like that, it tastes like pineapple. It's a good little um, little cocktail kind of, <laughs> kind of drink. It's, it's pretty good, and it helps soothe the upset stomach. Constipation is another really big thing, and oftentimes this is the root of all evil. It causes that nausea and vomiting, so really it's important not to exceed 72 hours without a bowel movement. I want to focus on increasing the insoluble fiber in the diet. So there's two types of fiber. There, are, there is soluble fiber and there is insoluble fiber. Soluble fiber adds bulk to stool. And insoluble fiber helps move things along. So this is going. This is what we need at this time if you're constipated. So um, bran, prunes, plum juice, potatoes with the skin on it, popcorn. Um, also, all the Fiber One products. Those are all great sources of insoluble fiber. Um, and always remembering to pair this with a lot of fluid. So it's important to really when you're increasing your fiber intake to also increase your fluid intake to help with that mobility. I'm eating a high-fiber breakfast with a hot drink. So, you know, for example, having bran muffins and sneaking in the prune juice in place of the water and having a, a nice hot tea with it can really help move things along. Regular activity, um, if gas is a problem, emitting any kind of carbonated drink, gum, straws, 
uh, cruciferous vegetables, cucumbers, dried peas, beans, onions, these are all things that are going to add odor. So if we take all that out of the picture, some people, no matter what they eat, it's just not enough. And so please don't be shy to talk to your doctor about getting you on a bowel regimen or your dietitian. This is um, something I work with my patients all the time, guiding them how much Seneca can I actually take, how much colase. Um, I will tell you that colase is merely a stool softener, so if that's all you're on, that is not that is not going to do anything. Seneca helps move things along. You can actually add milk of magnesia and Miralax to that regimen, and but really, you know, that's what your dietitian, your doctor are there for to help you with that if that's an issue. Um, the other end of the spectrum is diarrhea. So limiting fat, sugar, artificial sweeteners, and caffeine, these all exacerbate diarrhea. So if you're having more than four loose bowel movements a day, you really need to focus on staying hydrated and replenishing your stores with eight ounces of clear liquid isotonic solution. So this isotonic solution, is, that is something that doesn't have the added fat, the added sugar, the artificial sweeteners, or the caffeine that's going to be just neutral in your body. So Jello, G2. G2 is a product made by Gatorade with far less sugar in it than the actual Gatorade, but it still has the electrolytes, so that's a great product. Um, popsicles, watermelon, any kind of delicious fruit in the summer, you know, that's all going to have a lot of water to it. Um, it's soluble fiber, that's going to add the bulk to the stool, so eating things like banana, potato, rice, applesauce, smooth peanut butter, even um, over-the-counter products like Benefiber or Metamucil all add bulk to stools. They're all bulking agents. Um, another great one is our Rice Krispie Treats. So if uh, marshmallows are bulking agent and Rice Krispies are extremely easy to tolerate. So um, that can also be something if you're, if you're struggling with diarrhea. Um, Greek yogurt also is excellent because, again, it's pretty – it stays – it's just pretty easy on the stomach, has double the protein, and also contains those probiotics, which are just going to help keep your GI tract healthy. So when you're having all this diarrhea, you're going to have an overgrowth of the bad bacteria. But the Greek yogurt or the any kind of yogurt that says contains live and active cultures is going to replenish that bacteria, the good, healthy bacteria in the GI tract. Um, it's cool. It's easy to swallow. You can use it as a base for smoothies, toppings, for a whole grain waffle. Um, I have people that make popsicles out of them by dipping a banana in yogurt and rolling it in nuts and freezing it. Um, it there's so many ways to do that. And, again, with the, the banana, you're going to get the potassium and the yogurt, and you're going to get the probiotics and the nuts. You're going to get the magnesium. So it's going to have all the electrolytes that you need to replenish. Um, your your stores if you're having a lot of diarrhea. Uh, glutamine is another one that some people have had a lot of success with. If you have if you look to have 30 grams of glutamine a day, that can really um, it's it's worth a try if you've tried everything else. Um, there they sell glutamine as a powder. At, at our center, we would use glutazolve all the time because it was just natural glutamine. Make sure that you look for a product that um, doesn't have anything added into it that is just glutamine. Um, and, you know, ask your doctor again for some – or doctor, dietitian, um, pharmacist for some guidelines on how you can get your hands on some of this. Um, you know, the GNC stores will have it, but I know we sold it at our at our clinic. We sold the Glutazolve, and we also gave out tons of samples. So it's worth asking if you have access to a dietitian nearby. Um, hydration, again, is really important. Drinking 8 to 12 cups of caffeine-free, non-alcoholic liquids per day. Taking a water bottle when you're leaving home, and you can even um, put markers, uh, make lines with times on your water bottle and say, by 8 a.m. I want to drink 4 ounces, by noon I want to drink another 4 ounces, and so you have goals um, to drink uh, all throughout the day. Try to drink even when you're not thirsty. Again, staggering the liquids to the meal to increase overall liquids and solid intake. And then checking out your urine. You know, if it's darker than a pale straw color or has a strong odor, you likely need to drink more water. Um, fighting fatigue. This is such a big topic, especially um, with patients that are getting treatment or have any kind of blood disease. 
exercising each day, just making yourself getting up. And I'm not talking about running a marathon or anything like that, but taking the dog out for a walk after dinner or trying to get up in the morning and, you know, walk for breakfast this can, before you eat breakfast. This can also help improve your appetite. But, um, you know, just small goals of just trying to move more each day. Uh, preparing meals ahead of time and freezing them. Some people will even make, for example, a meatloaf in a muffin tin. And so then when you just want a single small serving, you can pop out one of your pre-prepared little meatloafs in your muffin tin and heat it up, and there you go. You have a very, you know, a small meal. Um, Using convenient foods that are ready to eat, letting friends and relatives help you. It's okay. I know people always ask, well, what? can I bring you? Well, you know, you could make up a snack list of things, you know, if you had um, some dried fruit, trail mix, anything with added honey in it, or granola is a great way to get some extra calories, um, hard-boiled eggs, cheese and crackers. Make up a little list and just say, here's my snack list, you know, pick something on there. Um, that can be helpful. Fluids, again, make sure to focus on that. Dehydration can worsen the fatigue. Protein, we've talked about this a lot, and making sure that we're going to be oxygenating all the cells in our body by getting enough protein, increasing rest, getting more sleep at night. It's okay to take a couple naps throughout the day. Really talk to your physician about what they would recommend. I know that, um, you know, a couple very short cat naps are often energizing, but, you know, if you find yourself sleeping all day, Take out that caffeine and try to focus on, you know, getting more sleep at night. Um, and also exercising throughout the day can help with that. Um, avoid skipping meals. Try to eat even when you're when you are tired. It's just going to it's think about it as food being your fuel and having something to drink every two to three hours. Just make it a priority if, even if you don't feel like it, it's gonna be good for you. So now we're going to change gears and talk a little bit about food safety. Um, now, this is really important. Um, we use a common sense approach at our center um, to lower the risk of infection. Um, it's just we don't – and to encourage diet flexibility and to eat as well as possible. So I'm not going to put a, a whole bunch of hard and fast rules on things because really our main goal is for you to eat. And if you are eating without a problem, then then great. Then we can talk about food safety in, a, you know, a more structured way. But if you're really having even problems of finding food, well, it's okay to have, you know, some – it's okay to have fruit that's been washed well and that, um, you know, it, you don't have to eat canned fruit if that's not appealing to you. Um, but, again, each physician has their own school of thought around this. This is just what we did at our center we exercise the common sense approach. So really ask your doctor before um, to see what would be best for you and your treatment plan. Making sure that people wash their hands. If you've had a transplant, you need to follow this, these guidelines for three months if you've had an auto. For aloe, following the diet until off all immunosuppressive therapy. And so I've listed a lot of those down below. Okay, so, oh, excuse me, so food safety. So what are the restrictions? So really trying to keep hot food hot and cold food cold, and we call this the danger zone. If something's supposed to be cold, it needs to be less than 40 degrees Fahrenheit, and if it's hot, it needs to be at least 140 degrees Fahrenheit. If you are reheating food, I would make it even um hotter than that, 160 or 170, 180 even. You know, we want it piping hot if it's supposed to be piping hot when you reheat. Um, avoiding raw meat and fish. Avoiding aged cheeses, especially the key here is to make sure they are pasteurized. We, if they're pasteurized, it's okay. We don't want any unpasteurized aged cheese. Avoiding raw or unpasteurized drinks, honey, unroasted nuts, Avoid homemade fermented drinks, homemade wine, cider, root beer, miso, vinegar, and 
staying clear of those buffets. Um, they're wide open for all kinds of contamination, salad bars, crowded restaurants. If you're going through a salad bar, if you're at Jason's Deli or what have you, you can always tell them to you know, prepare yours in the back where the food has been refrigerated and shielded from sneezing and kids' hands and all those other germs, and, you know, they're happy to do that. Um, remember, it's their job to serve you. So washing fruits and vegetables well, really all you have to do is just scrub this and remove any visible soiling with water. And um, all of those specialized scrubs, they really, the literature does not support their effectiveness. So, um, you know, just washing well with water is the best. And paying attention to recalls and alerts, the FDA has a, on their website, if you Google FDA recalls and alerts, you can actually sign up to receive alerts for any kind of um, food safety information. And so you'll get an email when there is something that, you know, if you need to avoid spinach or if you need to avoid, you know, whatever has been contaminated at that time, they'll let you know. Um, another good tip for food safety, well, um, if you're interested in buying organic or looking out for the pesticides, um, the Environmental Working Group puts forth a list of the dirty dozen foods and the clean 15, and that, again, is the Environmental Working Group, and it's www.ewg.org. And what they do, um, this list is constantly changing depending on the seasons or the year or, you know, what's being imported. And so you can pay attention to what foods um, would be best for you to buy organic and which foods are just fine, to, fruits and vegetables are fine to eat, you know, by themselves. Of course, if it has, uh, but if it has a peeling on it, like a banana, that you don't need to buy organic for those products. But if it's something like strawberries or other types of berries, you know, then those might be ha those may have more pesticides on them. So pay attention to the Environmental Working Group if you're interested on that. Um, now supplements. Of course, um, the reasons for caution. I think, um, of course, they're not FDA regulated, so really, there's no. They can put whatever they want on their label, and it may or may not be an actual uh, supplement that you're taking. My big reason for caution is that a lot of these have blood thinning or thickening properties. And a lot of patients in this population have either diseases where their blood is too thin or their blood is too thick. And so one of one in particular, a lot of a lot of patients came to me and they started taking vitamin K. And vitamin K thickens blood. And so um not the K2, that's the synthetic form that's been, you know, circulating around, but, but it's just normal vitamin K. And, you know, I've had patients that have very thick blood to begin with, but they think that they're doing themselves a favor by taking additional vitamin K. That's not okay. You know, that's going to thicken your blood even more. Um, and on the other hand of the spectrum, a lot of these supplements are vasodilators, meaning that they thin blood. And so if you're already having... Um, issues with your blood being too thin, then several of these, of these supplements, it's not going to say it on the label, but once I start looking through all the ingredients, a lot of them contain blood thinning properties, um, which can put you at risk for so many different types of things that can result in hospitalization, which we don't want. Um, they can also lead to altered metabolism. So I use the example of grapefruit and statin drugs. A lot of people are familiar that if you're taking a statin for your blood pressure, um, you don't want to eat grapefruit because that can that can change how the medication works. Well, similarly, similarly, a lot of the medications that you're taking from your doctor can be altered by the same mechanism um, in grapefruit that is in a lot of these supplements. And again, this is not going to be on the label, but um, you know, I go through and go through all the different herbs that are in in these different supplements and several of them use the same pathway that grapefruit uses and can still alter the metabolism of your specific drugs that you're taking from your doctor. So um, we want your medications to work and we want them to work in the correct amount. We don't want it to be too concentrated or too diluted. And so this is really important. 
um, another example of this is if, if you're taking Velcade, which is a medication that a lot of my patients, it's um, an injection that a lot of my patients get, green tea can interfere with this. And so we don't want patients that are getting Velcade to be drinking green tea. And a lot of people think, well, green tea is great for you. It's healthy. It has some antioxidants. Well, not if you're taking Velcade. So this is when it's really important for to contact your dietitian, preferably an oncology dietitian or someone that's trained to look through all of the different herbs and all the different vitamins and know and compare them to your medication list. And so you're not doing anything that's going to hurt yourself. Um, antioxidants, very high doses of antioxidants in supplement form has been shown to inhibit some types of chemo and radiation. So this is I want you to eat all the fruits and vegetables in the world, but when you take it in a pill form, at like high doses of vitamin C or any kind of infusion, this is not recommended if you're getting active chemo and radiation. So, um, again, we want that those medications, those treatments to work to their full potential, and antioxidants can interfere with that. Some of these supplements have hormonal properties. So um, soy isoflavone, for example, acts like an estrogen in the body. So if you have um, a cancer or any type of, if you're on any kind of medication that um, is supposed to act or block or prevent estrogen, you're not going to want to be having eating anything that's going to have processed soy in it, so the soy isoflavone. So any of the Morning Star um, meals or any of the soy protein shakes or bars or anything like that, we don't want to have that if you're getting specific types of treatment. High doses of herb and vitamin toxicity, um, high doses of herbs and vitamins can also lead to toxicity. Um, and here, it's important to check your facts. So the Memorial Sun Kettering Herbal Database um, is an excellent resource. You can input whatever herb that you're taking or whatever supplement that you're taking and it will pop it will tell you what it interferes with if it's safe if it's not safe um and then quack watch is also a great resource because quack watch you can type in any supplement again and it will tell you you know for your you know what does this interact with is this safe is it okay what did we think about this and um is this a sham it'll tell you so that's a great one Again, I like to say, you know, try to get your, your nutrition from your foods, you know, looking, eating from the rainbow. Um, and this is a great chart. It just says, it shows all the phytochemicals on here. And really, foods work the best when they're eaten in a variety and eaten together. And so um, we can get all of these different phytochemicals in the diet from the foods that we're eating that are just going to be helpful in preventing all types of diseases um, from um and keeping our bodies healthy and happy and full of energy. So really trying to focus on this before we pursue the supplement route. Um, here's This is on the eatright.org. This is how you find a registered dietitian near you if you want someone to check on your supplements. You can just go to www.eatright.org and find a dietitian. You can put in your specific um, disease state or your interest or what you're looking for and someone will pop up and um, you can contact them and they can help you if you don't have a dietitian at your center. Um, again, here are some excellent resources of things that we talked about. And um, that is going to finish our presentation today. And I'm happy to answer any questions. So I'll hand it over to Katrell. Thank you so very much. We did have several questions that came in during the presentation. The first one is, what effect does increased exposure to sunlight have on MDS? They state that consistently their counts are more stable or higher in the, in the, uh, during sunnier or summer periods, but they live in um, a very gray northwestern part of the United States. Um, that's a great question, and you know what? Um, there is so much research that's coming up out about the benefits of vitamin D um, in general. And so what they're talking about there is um, vitamin D in the diet. And really, all you need from sunlight is 15 minutes a day of sunlight. Now, if you are in an area um, where it's just not sunny for 15 minutes out of the day, Focusing on increasing the vitamin D in your diet and making sure you consume it with a source of calcium is great. 
um, that's going to help optimize. That's going to optimize the absorption the best. Um, so if you are if you drink milk, then that's going to have it's going to be fortified with vitamin D. Also yogurt. Um, also, if you wanted to just pick up a citric cow plus D, that's a supplement over the counter. You could take that each day. Um, make sure citric cow is great because um, it contains calcium citrate as the active form of calcium, and that's going to be the best absorbed um, by the body. And so when you have some a calcium that's well absorbed, the D is also going to be well absorbed. So look for those to be together. So, um, again, I, I recommend Citracal Plus D. I think that's a pretty reliable product. Great question. Thank you. The next question is, this patient has been instructed to drink Gatorade after their treatment because of low sodium and electrolytes. It seems, however, that they are drinking tons of sugar. Are there better alternatives? Can this patient get these minerals by eating certain foods? Absolutely. Um, you know, if if you are concerned about the sugar, um, the all you're looking for really with the Gatorade is um, sodium, potassium, and carbohydrate. That's what's in the Gatorade. So, um, G2 is if you if you like drinking that, then G2 is a product made by Gatorade that's still going to have the salt, the potassium, and the carbohydrate. But it's going to have less sugar in it. Um, so that is one option. Also, any type of food in the diet um, that is going to be salty, you can have any kind of nuts, salted nuts. Um, that is going to be a great source of the um, of the salt. And then potassium, you know, bananas, potatoes, tomatoes are all great sources of potassium. Um, you can just make sure that you have that in your diet as well. And um, the carbohydrate, if you are eating one of those um, fruits or vegetables that I just listed for the, the potassium, you're going to be getting your carbohydrate in there too. So if you just wanted to have, you know, a handful of um, nuts or crackers or pretzels or something salty and then, you know, also having a great source of potassium from uh, tomato juice or, you know, tomato juice would actually have the salt and the potassium in it and the carbohydrate, um, you're going to be just fine. The next question is, are marine products like blue-green algae good for stem cell nutrition? Now, you know, um, I wouldn't – That's a. there's a big jump there. Blue-green algae is kind of – it's great. It's becoming really popular because it has tons of antioxidants in it. Um, I would – if you are receiving treatment, I would run it by um, – your doctor or your pharmacist to make sure that it doesn't inter interact or interfere with your medications that you're taking. Um, but if you're not taking any medication, and that that's completely fine, and you know it it might help, and you know I think it would be something worth giving it a shot if you like it. A second part of that question is: Is shark liver oil immunomodulating? You know, that is one that, again, um, there's just really no, there's no research that supports shark liver oil. Um, I would, what I would do, I would keep it to either in making sure you're getting a good source of omega-3s and omega-6s in the diet. So just taking a regular fish oil supplement might be best. Um, the shark liver, liver oil, um, there's, we really don't know how pure it is and, it's not going to help um, with your immune function. I would just, um, well, I mean, but the, the, the thing that helps with the immune system is the omega, the ratio of omega-3s to omega-6s. So I would just keep it simple and just, um, you know, do the, the fish oil from a reputable company. That would be the best. Thank you. The next question is in reference to being neutropenic with MDS. Does that mean no fresh fruit, veggies, or yogurt, and most cheeses are not permitted? Again, you're going to have to run it by your physician. At our center, fresh fruit and veggies were completely fine, as was yogurt, um, as long as you washed the fruit and vegetables very well and removed any visible soil. Um, there's really no literature that supports supports um, not having the, the fresh fruit and vegetables in the diet. There's, 
it's really, you can't do a study where you put some patients at risk for possibly getting sick from eating raw fruits and vegetables and then some from just eating canned vegetables. So there's really, that's why there's just a big question mark with that. So run it by your physician. Um, again, at our center, it was fine. Just remove all visible soil. Again, probiotics in um, the live and active cultures in yogurt was completely fine as well. Um, but make sure that when you're looking for all these products, the key is pasteurization. So with the cheese, um, we at our center, we were fine with the cheeses and the yogurt as long as it was pasteurized. The next question is from a patient who's lost muscle mass, although they've always had a healthy diet. Is there anything that can help bring muscles back? The patient is 77 years old, very active, and has had MDS for five years. Absolutely. Again, the best thing to do is to really focus. Um, the first step is focusing on overall calorie intake, so making sure you're getting enough calories to first maintain your weight because, um, you know, we want to – I had a patient one time that was just eating his needs that we estimated in protein. Well, this wasn't giving him enough overall calories, so he continued to lose weight and he continued to break down muscle mass. So first and foremost, I would just set a goal to meet the cat daily calorie needs. Um, so high-calorie um, drinks and foods, small frequent meals and snacks, really trying to sneak those calories in any which way you can. That's going to be the best, trying to maximize each bite of food. Um, now, after you've met your calorie needs, which are going to be higher even because, you know, you have already lost weight and your body's in the catabolic mode where it's wanting to break things down, then I would also encourage you to start, you know, run it by your doctor. But if you could do some light weight-bearing exercises, some, you know, lifting very small, you know, three-pound weights or, you know, asking them for some guidance on where you should start, um, depending on you and your background and your strength level already. But I think it would be helpful to start um, some light weight-bearing exercises. But again, focus on those calories. I would really remove any diet restrictions if you have them right now. Go for the milkshake. Go for, you know, any calories. Eating calories is better than restricting at this time. Thank you. Are there things that can be eaten to eliminate bloating caused by steroids or other medications? Um, you know, protein is going to help displace a lot of the extra fluid. So if you focus on eating a lean source of protein um, frequently throughout the day, that's going to help not only maintain that lean muscle mass, so a side effect from steroids is you're going to start breaking down muscle mass if you've been on it for a, a time longer than two weeks. So that protein also helps push off that extra fluid. So a great place to start is focusing on are you eating enough lean protein throughout the day. Um, again, another thing that you can focus on is just trying to reduce the salt. Salt's just going to make it worse. Salt attracts water, and it's going to um, increase the bloating. So increase the protein and decrease the salt. This next question states, is it permissible to have small amounts of wine or other alcohol while getting chemotherapy? That, again, um, each doc has their own school of thought. I mean, you have to ask them directly, and don't be shy about asking it because um, they ask, people ask all the time, and really um, some um, physicians think one glass of wine is completely fine as well as, as long as you stay very well hydrated. The big fear is that you're not, um, alcohol is going to dehydrate uh, you. So um, focus on hydration, ask your doctor first. And sometimes people, doctors will just say, well, make sure not to have it 24 hours before you get your chemo or the three days following your chemo, but then outside of that window, it's completely fine. Um, it's again, it's specific for each each physician. Again, if you are a woman and you have um, any kind of hormone issues, or you have a, if you do have a, another kind of a cancer related to, um, or if it's estrogen receptive positive, alcohol acts like estrogen in the body also. So you may not want to have that. So it's just going to depend on you and your treatment plan. We just have a few more questions. Mm -hmm. This one is under the 
category of myth or fact. They've heard that eating for your blood type is helpful. Is this something to consider, or is that a myth? It really, uh, you know, it's a it's a myth. Um, I it, it's a myth. I think that that book has some, you know, it has some good points to it. But really, I would just, unfortunately, we can't really tailor our diet to our blood type. But I would more so encourage you just to follow. Um, the recommendations that we talked about earlier. Thank you. Do you r recommend ginseng? I don't. Ginseng is one of those that it seems to get in the way of everything. <laughs> so um, if you're taking medications, then that is one that does interfere with several different other types of medications. And you really, if you're um, really into ginseng, I would definitely get your pharmacist to go through your medication list and make sure it doesn't interact. Um, but um, it does. It, it, it tends to interact with a lot of different things. And we just have one final question. Is there any evidence that cherry juice or cherry active improves red blood cell counts? No, not it doesn't improve the, the red blood cell counts, but I do think, you know, it, it's a great source of antioxidants and it may help you um, stay, it, it may help you feel better and it also may um, give you more liquids in your diet. So it might um, help to improve your energy because you're getting more liquids and having more antioxidants and it also has a mild laxative effect. So I don't think there's any problem with it, but um, as far as, Increasing your red your red blood cell the counts it's not it's not really helpful with that protein's really the only thing that will help with that. Thank you so much for your informative presentation and also your time. And on behalf of the Aplastic Anemia and MDS International Foundation, I would like to thank each of you for joining us today and for making us your resource of choice for information on bone marrow failure diseases. If we were unable to answer your question today, please send it to us via email at help, H-E-L-P, at aamds.org so that our patient educator can respond or visit our online learning center for interviews with experts and other programs that may address your question. If you would like to connect with other patients and families in your own town, the Aplastic Anemia MDS International Foundation has built communities of hope. These are volunteer-led local support groups designed to create an ongoing local organization to connect patients and families with each other to provide a local resource for peer support, information exchange, and education. To learn how to get involved with a local community, community of hope support group, please visit our website at www.aamds.org. As a reminder, as soon as I'm done speaking, a post-event survey will appear on your screen requesting your feedback. We appreciate you taking the time to complete this survey. Again, thank you for joining us, and please remember, we are here to provide you with answers, support, and hope. This concludes today's program. Thank you. <laughs>